It was an obscure and cryptic text of scripture, a little phrase hidden in a strange oracle spoken by an ancient and puzzling prophet. And then suddenly that little phrase exploded on the American consciousness in the auspicious year of 1844 and has been a featured fact in American high school history textbooks ever since. So let's see, a text of scripture? American history? 1844? No, we're not talking about Daniel 814. Something far more obscure and yet now is famous. Buried in the book of Numbers, four little words that so aptly express the sum of our astonishment when there is really nothing else to say. What hath God wrought? What hath God wrought? Those are the words that Samuel Morse tapped out as the first official telegraph message ever sent, transmitted on May 24, 1844. He sent it over a wire strung between the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. and an office in Baltimore, Maryland, in a demonstration to Congress to prove what his new device could do. Those four little words both announced and encapsulated an incredible new era of mass communication that continues to this day. And in our case, those four little words describe an incredible era of 40 years, 40 years in this faith community, an amazing era of spreading a message around the world. You may remember the context of where those four words came from. Balaam, the unwilling, incorrigible prophet, just can't help himself as he looks down from a mountain on the people he is supposed to curse. But all he can do is prophesy a bright era for God's people. In the Old King James it says, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? He doesn't give any details, no poetic metaphors about national glory, conquest, blessing, wealth, joy, peace, no. To describe what people will say about that time, it's just, What hath God wrought? Wow! This is the time that will be described as, look what God has done. What were those times? Those were the what hath God wrought times. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to remember, think, talk, sing, laugh, cry about an era, about 40 years, about which the only thing we can say that sums it all up is what hath God wrought, and we're going to thank Him for it.
Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, 40 years ago, you looked ahead to this day and you ordered the lives of thousands that they might be blessed. Thousands to be blessed by what has taken place in our world, in our church, in our town, and in this very place that we celebrate today through the life of one whom you raised up to serve you. We celebrate today, God, what you have done through this life. May everything that is said and done today be to your name's honor and glory, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. What hath God wrought? Thank you for joining us today, whether here in person or online. It is a most unique event in the history of the Advent movement. There has never been a program for such a purpose, and it is highly unlikely that there will be another for the same purpose. A farewell celebration to thank the Lord for the ministry of a husband and wife in one place, in one pulpit, for 40 years. Should the glorious event pictured in that rose window not take place soon, then the younger ones among us here today will be able to say, Years from now, I was there on that day. I saw how we praised the Lord for 40 years of the ministry of Dwight K. Nelson and Karen Nelson within these very walls. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we've come to do. As the old song says, I just came to praise the Lord. We just came to praise the Lord. We just came to praise His holy name. We just came to praise the Lord. So you won't hear a lot about specific deeds or dates. We will not relive a fact-by-fact -fact history of Pioneer Memorial Church we will not point out every detail or profile every person. No one will be profiled that was critical in the shaping of these 40 years alongside the ministry that we celebrate today. But we will do this. We will try to capture a little gleam, like the late afternoon sun coming through that window of what God hath Rot. What wondrous things God has done in your life, in my life, in our collective life, here and around the world through the ministry of Pastor Dwight Nelson. Amen. More than 20 years ago, Pastor Dwight spoke three simple words to Pastor Skip and me. And the impact of those words continues to demonstrate how God has blessed many through Pastor Dwight's influence. Brian Bonderpowski, Pastor Skip, and I had presented a Becoming a Contagious Christian seminar to more than 400 of our Pioneer members. At a staff meeting, Skip and I shared our evaluations. Our members had stated that they wanted to know how to specifically share their Adventist faith. Dwight said, your mandate is clear, create a seminar. <laughs> Easier said than done, it took 10 years before the seminar material was created, tested, and published. But during those 10 years, God did a work in our own lives. Dwight has always modeled that we cannot effectively preach or teach what we have not experienced. So in preparing this material for the seminar, it forced us to each live intentionally. We learned to recognize and create contagious Adventist moments in our everyday lives. We dug deeper into the Bible to see the beautiful character of Jesus in each teaching. 
we documented how the biblical teachings had personally impacted us. We prepared ourselves for those contagious Adventist moments when the Holy Spirit would connect our stories with those we were trying to reach so we could connect them with God's story. It was an exciting way to live, and we were changed. I was changed. Pastor Dwight, thanks for inviting me to join the pastoral team in 1997. And thanks for those three words that commissioned the creation of the Contagious Adventist Seminar. In my work with the North American Division, this is the topic that I'm asked to speak on the most. It continues to inspire me and many others to live as Contagious Adventist Christians every day. Thank you. In September 1996, I was a sophomore social work major at Andrews University. As I was sitting in Pioneer Memorial Church that second Sabbath of the school year, I remember that Pastor Dwight passionately shared a quote that deeply touched my heart as he preached about the needs in Benton Harbor, Michigan. He said, we must come to the place where what breaks the heart of God breaks our hearts too. I immediately felt the tug of the Holy Spirit on my heart to do something for God. As the service came to an end, I looked around and grabbed five other friends and said, we have to go down there. After eating lunch, we started the drive to Benton Harbor. We prayed with so many people that day. This started a weekly Sabbath afternoon ministry called Benton Harbor Street Ministries. Hundreds and hundreds of students over the years participated and spent their Sabbath afternoons in ministry to that community, doing children's programs, health visits, Bible studies, and finally planting a small house church through Pastor Dwight's Net 98 evangelistic meetings that eventually became Harbor of Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church that serves those same streets and neighborhoods today more than 27 years later. I want to thank Pastor Dwight for allowing the Lord to use him to speak to my heart through that sermon. My life was forever changed. Pastor Dwight, may you never lose your zeal for inspiring others to minister for Jesus. Thank you for what you did for me. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Esther and Heidi for that powerful testimony. Now it's time for a live poll. We want to find out just how well you know Pastor Dwight, and we want to find out the kind of impact that has had on your life as well. So here's what we're going to do. We've got a series of questions we're going to ask, not all at the same time, don't worry. Here's the first question. We're going to put the information on the screen so you can participate in the poll. The question is, what is one word you think about when you think of Pastor Dwight? So we're going to put that on the screen now. Just turn to a younger neighbor. They know how to do it. They'll, they'll figure it out for you and just ask for some help. See, some people have already figured it out, y'all. They're starting to get the words on the screen. The question is, what is one word you think about when you think of Pastor Dwight? They're saying leadership, shepherd, humility, trust. Ooh, I, I saw brood on there. That's a popular one. Runner, swag. We'll let that go for a few more seconds. And Pastor Dwight, I mean, this, this is what... People think of you. This is how they see you. And we're going to have to come back to these, Pastor Dwight, so you can just kind of bask in them and get the full appreciation for them. We're going to move to the next question, though. Thank you for participating in that one. You are already going. Okay. So the next question is that one. What is the word you've heard him say the most? So surely as you've hung around these here parts with Pastor Dwight, there are certain words that stand out to you about what he's kind of said the most. And some of you are putting them in. Boy, adios. I, I saw someone, megalophone. Someone put megaphone. Genuine, caring, quiet. Sissy. Yeah, we hear those during the children's stories as it's calling up the, the young girls. Okay, good. Wow. Quite a few. Yo, I saw that one. Manana. We heard that one today. In other words, we love Pastor Dwight, and for all of us, there's certain words that have stood out to you concerning things that his said. There, I have my own ones that have stood out to me through the years, but I don't have a phone on me, so I'm not going to text right now. Well, friends, I think you're good to go for the subsequent questions. We're not going to do the rest of them right now. Thank you for participating, and now we turn to the face of 40 years.
The man that God has given us is real, and he's sitting right here. But he's also in our imagination and memory, larger than life, both frozen in time and warm in the flesh. Over 40 years, God has blessed us with his ministry, your ministry, Pastor. He started out when he was 31, and he has been here for an incredible 40 years. And what do those 40 years mean? How can we quantify or visualize that sweep of history or bring it into mind? Most of us just have a piece of it. A few years in this town, a few years in this school or work. Maybe that plus many more years through seeing broadcasts and watching on the internet. Some few here today even have the whole thing right from the very beginning from right here in this place. What does that look like? What did he look like? I grew up in Berrien Springs, grateful for the safe space and the church, where I learned to be a leader. I'm shy and introverted, and Pastor Dwight's advice and prayers encouraged me. In my last year of my master's degree, I committed myself to volunteer for AFN, but I was hesitant. I asked God to assure me because I was jumping into unknown territory by choosing to serve God in Thailand. I took a leap of faith and decided to leave that December. On my last Sabbath, God assured me through Pastor Dwight's farewell words and prayer. So as Pastor Dwight said, Goodbye, Period Springs, hello world. I was hearing God telling me, Are you ready? Here we go. Pastor Dwight's prayer confirmed my conviction of God's blessing and his call on my life to serve him in Thailand. I knew at that point that God had answered my prayer. My experience so far validates that God prepares us for service through spiritual leaders who work and support young people. How has this man impacted my life? Well, at first, not much. My very first memory of Dwight Nelson is my parents calling me into the living room. They were watching some Christmas special on ABC and they said, Chad, look, that's an Adventist on TV. I looked at the screen and I saw this mustachioed man and I thought, eh, and I walked out of the room. Years later, I was a freshman at Union College and there was another Nelson that was a preacher there at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, why is everyone making such a big deal about the Nelson up in Michigan? This guy not only can preach, but he can sing. Yet even though I didn't see the potential in Dwight, Dwight saw the potential in me. We became acquainted in my early days at the seminary and one day I was walking through the parking lot behind the Pioneer Memorial Church and Dwight saw me and he called me over and he said, boy, 
I believe you have the potential to be a leader in this church, and I want to help prepare you for that. We're going to meet weekly to talk about ministry. And that's what we did. Dwight, true to his word, met with me every single week throughout the rest of my seminary time. Yet it did not end there. Now, 20 years later, whenever I have a big decision or a big idea that I want to run by somebody, I still call Dwight and ask him for his counsel. Dwight, I thank you so much for seeing the potential in me all those years ago and choosing to invest your time and your wisdom into my life. Thank you for impacting my life for the kingdom of God. I love you, brother. Can't help but say amen to that, correct? Ladies and gentlemen, we're honored this afternoon to have with us the Ministerial Director for the North American Division, Dr. Ivan Williams. George Clemenceau, who was the former Prime Minister of France, in the early 20s said, there is no greater functionary than his or her function. Dr. Dwight Nelson, Pastor Nelson, you have functioned well. After preaching hundreds of sermons, ministering to hundreds of grieving families, and standing at the altar with hundreds of in love couples saying, I do and I will. After hundreds of meetings and over thousands of baptisms, I praise God today for your faithful function. I remember as a student being here in the late 80s in the seminary, and I must say your mustache was a lot thicker then. <laughs> And of course, your hair was a lot darker. But if Moses were here, Moses would say, 40 years? Dwight, you're just getting started. You've got 80 more to go. If the priests were here from the Old Testament, who retired generally by the age of 50, they would say, Dwight, you lasted a long time. But I praise God today that Jesus confronting one of his called disciples, Peter, on the shore when he declared to Peter, who used to speak first and pray second, he said, Peter, do you really love me? Then feed my sheep. Dwight, you have done a marvelous, faithful witness job of feeding the sheep. We give God the praise for your preaching, for your pastoring, for your mentoring of hundreds, yea, thousands of ministers who've come through the seminary while you were pastoring in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We give God the praise for all that you have done by not just speaking it, but by living it. I had the great privilege to get to know you and Karen over in an island called Palau, and Kathleen sends her love to you, Karen. And I just want to say on behalf of 4,300 ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the North American Division, how proud we are, how thankful we are, and hey, there are a whole lot of other ministers who need your mentoring. We give God the praise for your witness and we thank God for him using you. And really, brothers and sisters, we will truly only know the impact of this ministry in the earth made new. Can we say amen for Dr. and Mrs. Dwight Nelson? God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also honored to have present with us Elder Jim Mitchell, President of the Michigan Conference. Yeah. Dwight, it's a joy to be here. Elder Gallimore, who has or was the president for 27 of those 40 years, uh, wasn't able to come, but he did give me a little something to read to you. 
Pastor Dwight Nelson, with four decades of being senior pastor at PMC, you have the record perhaps of the longest tenure of any one Seventh-day Adventist minister in North America. As you make the transition to a less pressurized form of ministry, we know that you will continue to serve the Lord with all your heart. We will also want to hear those solid biblical messages, although in different settings, that have made you one of the most respected and appreciated pastors and preachers in the Adventist world. I've always believed that you were gifted, extraordinary, especially in preaching the great fundamental teachings of the Adventist church. You may be changing gears, but let the Lord use your years of retirement to help proclaim the three angels' message to a world that is falling apart. Wishing you all of God's blessings in the days ahead. Jay Gallimore. I came to this conference in 1996 as an unordained minister. Uh, Dwight had already been here over a decade. And in that time period, I had the privilege of attending one of his seminars. He told us, you looked out and you said, gentlemen, some of you will want to move every three, four, five years, perhaps. And if you do, you're going to broaden your perspective and your ministry. But if you want to deepen your relationship with God and deepen your ministry, stay in one spot. Because you can't stay unless you do. Dwight, you have lived out that for 40 years. You have been digging deep. You've had an impact on this conference and beyond. Not just in this community, but also as you think of all the students that have come through this institution, all the pastors that you've put a little imprint on. I've talked to many in the field and they, they've said, you know, when I think back on what I should do in this certain circumstance or how I should preach, I always think of Dwight. But the problem is I can't preach like Dwight. <laughs> it's not about being like Dwight in his preaching. It's about being faithful like Dwight has been. God bless you. We do have a medallion that will commemorate your 40 years here in Michigan. We'll give it to you a little later. God bless you. The things that break the heart of God should break our hearts as well. Pastor Dwight, you spoke those words in the spring of 1998. Those words gave birth to a baby called Hope, Harb of Hope. And here we are, 25 years later, and they still ring true today. For a city that was struggling under the stresses of economic hardship, bad politics, gun violence, and gang culture, hope is what was needed, and hope is what was delivered and is still being delivered to this day. It's being delivered in boxes of food, warm meals, community rallies, marches, mentoring, gardening, tutoring programs, Bible studies, the preaching of the gospel, and baptisms. On behalf of your Harbor of Hope family, thank you for inspiring hope. I personally want to thank you for your supportive leadership over the years. It's been an honor to serve with you I've been inspired by your integrity, your wisdom, your self-discipline, your courage, your love for Jesus, your love for Karen, your handwritten birthday cards, and your ice cream socials. As you and Karen transition to the next phase of your journey, keep hope alive, for the best is yet to come. In 1996, I traveled with Pastor Dwight to Belgrade, Serbia, the former Yugoslavia, where he preached a three-week evangelistic series preaching twice every day and three times on Sabbath. In the afternoon meeting, he would preach in the large communist hall where President Tito of Yugoslavia used to preside for 37 years. The evening meeting was held in the main Adventist church in Belgrade. We were told that the state police were among our large afternoon crowds to assure that Pastor Dwight wasn't preaching political messages promoting democracy under the guise of being there for religious purposes. That series resulted in a new congregation 
being formed in Belgrade. One thing that was embedded in my consciousness on that trip with Pastor Dwight, what you see in public is what he is in private, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. At the end of those meetings, conference president took us to the neighboring Kosovo that had recently been heavily bombed by Serbia, and it was nearly deserted. At one point, Pastor Dwight jumped out of the car to take some pictures of a man who was walking down a deserted road. The next we knew, the man was at our car with his gun stuck through the car window in a shouting match with the conference president. I was in the back seat, earnestly praying that God wouldn't let the innocent suffer with the guilty. God intervened, and the man backed off. The conference president told us that we could easily have been shot and killed that very day right there. I love and admire so many qualities about Pastor Dwight, but the one I particularly want to note is his passion for public evangelism. Shortly after Lynn and I arrived here in 1986, he held a Life Spirit Evangelistic Seminar at Lake Michigan College. Over the next 20 years, he preached two evangelistic series in South Bend, including one in the South Bend Convention Center, a short eight-night series in Fresno, California in connection with the Evidence series he hosted for Faith for Today. He led a team of staff members and students to India for a series he preached there in 1993. And he was the speaker for the denomination's Net 98 series, which was uplinked simultaneously in 40 different languages to every continent on Earth. What I understand had some 15,000 accessions to our faith, including 100 locally. Nor was his evangelistic involvement limited just to his own preaching. He was the impetus behind two Mark Finley Net series, which we downlinked here, two in-person Doug Batchelor campaigns on campus, which were taped by Amazing Facts and aired to reach many thousands beyond our campus. He was the inspiration behind the series with the relatively known Pastor Harry Mahondo that resulted in nearly 100 baptisms locally. In 2004, he asked Pastor Tim Nixon to preach an evangelistic series in Benton Harbor to follow up several years of student door-to-door -door ministries there in response to a sermon that Pastor Dwight had preached back in 1996. Tim's series launched PMC's satellite Harbor of Hope congregation there in Benton Harbor. I've never worked with a pastor that's had a stronger passion for evangelism than Pastor Dwight has. Both his recent evangelistic trip with his staff to Cuba and his recent sermon series on Mission Impossible, maybe, are reflections of his passion for the salvation of the lost. Pastor Dwight and Karen, we love you guys and while you're officially retiring from your ministry here at PMC, you still have the Holy Spirit's anointing, and I believe you have miles to go yet before you sleep. We have just heard Skip's assessment. I've never worked with a pastor who has a stronger passion for evangelism than what Pastor Dwight has. A man who has a passion for the salvation of lost people. We now have the Andrews University Singers under the direction of Stephen Zork, giving us a powerful choral rendering of our Savior's command to do what Dwight Nelson has done for these past 40 years.
All right, so there's a skeleton. Why is the skeleton on this stage? The skeleton is on the stage because it represents a system of 206 parts, 206 bones. The average skeleton, 206. To find out how many times it would take to get 206 in the right order, you have to go one times, two times, three times, four, all the way to 206. It's called 206 factorial, and when the uh, mathematicians write it, it's with 206 and an exclamation mark. That's called 206 factorial. Now, there's another way to write that number, and it's 10 to the 388. Now, 10 to the 388 means you have a 1 with 388 zeros after it. What would a number like that look like? Let's find out. That's what it looks like. The reality of design, I believe, is a compelling piece of evidence that there must have been a brilliant designer who put these irreducibly complex systems ready-made into operation. the seventh day wherein the maker of all things who loves and wants you and me invests himself embeds himself so that when you come to the day you get the day plus him now may the gift of Christ's first advent the glory of his second coming bring the bright hope of God's new Noel to your heart and to your home tonight and tomorrow and forever and ever amen Okay, so he's close, but how does he think of me? How does he think of you? Ooh, turn one more page, John 15, still the same Thursday night. John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, incontrovertible proof that God is not somebody to be afraid of. He is someone to be a friend of. That's what God's all about. I have called you friends. Okay, Dwight, so what is this uh, most significant truth with which I can face anything in the next millennium? Here it is. The God of the universe is offering the titanic generation tonight a forever friendship with him through Jesus Christ. Does that include the likes of you and me? Absolutely. Come on, folks, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter even how you feel about yourself right now. There is someone in the universe tonight who wants to be your friend. I know you've had friends walk out on you. Your lover has deserted you. Your spouse has divorced you. Your parents wrote you off. Your children have abandoned you. But tonight there is someone in this universe who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I want to be friends. I have for you a forever kind of love with a forever friendship. And forever, by the way, means it never ends. In 1998, I had just moved back to Michigan. It was a very difficult time for me personally. I remember hearing about the evangelistic series Net 98 and decided that I would attend every evening, and I did, hoping that God would somehow hear my cry. 
I was captivated by the format, the music, the excitement of the cameras and crowds, but most of all, the messages presented by Pastor Dwight each evening. I sat in the front of the church on the left-hand side, listening carefully to every word. And one night, Pastor Dwight said something that changed my life forever. He said Jesus wanted to be my friend, that He, Jesus, God, was not someone to be afraid of, but someone to be a friend of. What? Pastor Dwight continued to discuss the relationship that Jesus wanted with me, a forever friendship. As I drove home that evening, looking at the stars in the sky with tears in my eyes, I imagined Jesus saying, Debbie, I want to be your friend. Don't be afraid. I love you. Thank you, Pastor Dwight.
beautiful, haunting, magnificent, precious Lord, take my hand. Thank you, University Singers, Stephen Zork. That was powerful and beautiful. So, Pastor Dwight, I know that you're not 100% sure what you're going to do next. And so we as a church would like to help you. You're welcome. Figure out exactly what you're going to do. So, y'all, we're going to crowdsource this for him right now. Are you down? Shall we do that? Okay, so let's do the next poll question. Pull out your phones once again. And if you already voted once, you're ready to go. You just need to text in the word and it will get submitted. So here's the question. What do you think he should do next? So as he transitions out of here, what do you think he should do next? And you all know what you're doing. You're texting away. People are saying, stay, Harbor of Hope, gardening, Japan. Hello. Chicago, okay, Bokic, not sure what that is, Ultra Marathon, Iron Man, wow. I, I think I saw sailing in there somewhere. Marathon, I don't know if you're up for another marathon or not. We'll see. So again, Pastor Dwight, we'll, we'll download this afterwards for you, and you can just peruse all the different options that you're getting. So you're, you're very welcome for that. Okay, how about one more question? Let's see if anybody gets the exact number. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you if you're right. You're going to find out a little bit later in the program. The question is, how many sermons has he preached at Pioneer? So in his 40 years of ministry, I don't even know if you know that, Pastor Dwight, but somebody counts it, somebody confirmed. So how many sermons has he preached? No, not, not where, y'all. How many? We're looking for numbers, not the location. So how many numbers? Has he preached 500 sermons in the 40 years? Has it been, how many is it? So keep, put up your best guess. I see 1,600, 173, a little more than that. 3,000, 1,844. That's a pretty good number, pretty good guess. I see, I see what you did there. Okay, very good. So again, there is an exact number. I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you right now, but we're going to find out shortly in our very next part of the program. But now we turn to find out more about the team.
I might be biased, but I kind of feel like we got better looking as we went along. <laughs> You've probably been thinking just at this service, there are a lot of pastors up here. Well, I'll be honest with you. It's our turn to talk. <laughs> and we've got some things to share about you. The program planners have put us on a very short leash. They've made us stick to the script. And that's pretty hard. But it's probably a good thing because pastors aren't known for keeping it short. Well, Ben, maybe we would be here for hours, but they would have long since walked out. But we would have so much to say about the honor the Lord has given us and those before us in being partners with the man and the ministry that we are praising the Lord about today. Over the last four decades, there have been quite a few of us as you saw in that video. And you can find a full list of all of our comings and goings in the program. And you all know that Dwight is a humble man and a very affirming leader. And so he would be the first to say, team, I couldn't have done it without you. True. And the rest of you, we know how much you think of us. <laughs> you, you know, we know that right there on your refrigerator, with the pictures of those you love the most, is a picture of us as well. We've just watched a video, so don't, don't act like you don't think of us. The program planners thought it was important that you reflect for a moment on the team. But an important part of that team has been the women in ministry here. And so next, we want to spend a little bit of time focusing on that important part of the team. Well, I'm going to share with you about a time when Pastor Dwight made me cry. It all turned out okay, though. In 1983, the morning following his first sermon at Pioneer, Pastor Dwight was interviewed for an article for our Andrews Focus magazine. During that interview, Pastor Dwight responded to a question about the role of women in spiritual leadership by saying... I see no problem with women being elders at Pioneer. On Sabbath, November 16, 1985, two and a half years later, I was scheduled to have the pastoral prayer at Pioneer with Dwight, and with Dwight's creative sermon titles, that one being Fly Like an Eagle, The Atom Bomb. I had no idea what the topic was. So I was unprepared for a sermon that laid out a case for why women should not be elders. As I sat on the platform that day, I cried. I felt his sermon undermined my current role as a campus chaplain. Later that week, Dwight graciously debriefed his sermon with me and told me how he had specifically wanted me on the platform that Sabbath to show that he was not opposed to women in spiritual leadership. April 4, 1987, 72 Sabbaths later. After continued study, observation, prayer, and I believe because of the arrival of his precious daughter, Chrissy, Pastor Dwight preached a very different sermon. It was entitled, How Should We Then Live? The Two-Party Trap. That sermon began a process of dialogue, new dialogue, which eventually led to Pioneer voting to have women as elders. 
In 1997, 10 years later, while I was pastoring at Sligo Church, Michigan Conference and Pioneer Memorial Church, under the leadership of Dwight Nelson, called me to be the first female pastor at Pioneer. Since 1997, there have been six female pastors. You can see their pictures on the screen. And five of us are here today. Pastor Dwight, because of your support of women in spiritual leadership, serving as elders and pastors, the doors have been opened for women to be recognized as they have said yes to Jesus. I'd like to invite four of our elders, to, female elders, to come up here. And if you would step down to the second step. Pastor Dwight, in celebration of 40 years of ministry, 99 women who were serving as pastors and church administrators wanted their names to be on a list of women who wish to say thank you to you for your encouragement, the encouragement that you have given through your influence through the years. I think you get the idea. We knew it wouldn't fit in here. But I want to share three of the comments that came in. Dwight, your sermons were a huge part of my spiritual journey while I attended Andrews. It was during those years that I received the call from God to go into ministry. Pastor Delinda Hamilton, Northern California Conference. Another one wrote, in the fall of 2008, you preached a sermon challenging individuals to pack up their suitcase, laptop, Bible, and cell phone, and come out here to Andrews University to be a missionary for God. Because of that message, two of my friends came out here with me on a Greyhound bus, the most uncomfortable trip ever, with nothing in our pocket but the very strong passion to become missionaries for God. Look at me now, working full-time for the church, God's church. That very powerful message pierced my heart to work for God. Horny Gibbs, Michigan Conference. And the last one, thank you so much for supporting women clergy. We stand on your shoulders. I'm so blessed to serve as a pastor. Melody Darrow, Nevada, Utah Conference. Pastor Dwight, can't see you anymore. I'm, yeah, Pastor Dwight, look at what God has wrought through your ministry and your influence. I hope that makes you cry. <laughs> I want to share with you a new way to pray. It's a new way to pray because probably you have never prayed this way before. Whether you're, an, whether you're a millennial, whether you're a Gen Xer, boomer, senior, doesn't matter. A new way to pray. I've written a book entitled A New Way to Pray. Let me just summarize that in a few short moments. Here's step number six. Journal, journal your response. And this is where it becomes a new way to pray for you. Because most of you don't do this. I've been doing it now for a bunch of years. Now me, I, I'm so old-fashioned, I use one of these. You know what these are? These are composition books. Yeah, great little books. You can get these, you can get these at Walmart for 92 cents. 92 cents. You can get this at the dollar store for a dollar. Great. It's, yeah, it's true. It's a dollar. So that's where I get them. Save the gas. All right? I do it here. So if, if, if you're looking over my shoulder right now, you see, I write the date right here, and then I put the part of the verse that speaks to me. So I do that in red. So let's put that on. Do we already have that on there, date and verse in red? So that's what I do. You have nothing to lose. And I'm telling you what, you have everything, everything to gain. You'll never be the same again. Trust me, ever, ever again. For 40 years, the Lord has given us a powerful public preacher. And behind the scenes, the Lord has sustained a powerful private prayer. Before he is a man of the pulpit, Dwight Nelson is a man of prayer. And from the pulpit 
And in public evangelism, as we've just seen, he has preached powerfully on what it means to pray. As early as 1984, just nine months after coming here, he preached a six-part series from January into March on the premise of prayer, the priority of prayer, the pursuit of prayer, and the principle, the practice, and the promise of prayer. The very last night of Net 98, his topic was a new way to pray. In 2000, he preached a five-part series on the prayer of Jabez. He preached an evangelistic series in South Bend with an emphasis on a new way to pray. And, of course, scattered through these 40 years have been single sermons on particular prayers in the Bible. And through it all, we've become aware of just how incredibly much Dwight Nelson is a man of prayer. During Net 98, he told us that he began the practice of prayer journaling in August 1986. That's actually the year and month I was born. <laughs> And by 1998, his prayers, as he told us then, had filled 50 journals, and he has never stopped. Now, we've only seen one of those journals when he preached about them during Net 98 and once again in 2018. 148 separate journal books. We've done some estimates, and we believe that it's somewhere between 20 and 30,000 pages. Of course, we don't know what's in those journals. We never will. We can speculate. Fervent prayers of hope, despair, triumph, fear, joy in his personal day-after-day -day meditation on God's Word. Who knows? Prayers for this church. Prayers for this university. Prayers, prayers, prayers laboriously written out Prayers known to no one but to God alone. Riley, of course, they are known to no one but God alone, because as we all know, God's the only one who can figure out that handwriting. <laughs> yep, very true. And the point isn't so much what Pastor Dwight has done, but what he would like you to do. So to give you some idea of his commitment to prayer and his desire for you to make that same commitment, we have on this table 148 similar books. These are blank journal books, and today at the end of the program, if you would like to follow Pastor Dwight's example and make a commitment to journal your prayers as he has taught us, you can come and take one of these home as long as you promise to use it. Now there's... Only 148, so make sure you are serious. They have a special commemorative label on them, and maybe you can even get Pastor Dwight today or someday between now and May 20 to sign your journal and seal your promise to start this special journey with your forever friend. As Dr. Logan frames her thoughts from the Oregon Consul, take a moment to meditate on an inspiring example the Lord has given us in this truly great man of prayer. Wait and Karen, as we reflect on the legacy of your incredible leadership, two words come to my mind, never and forever. We will never have another lead pastor that'll put up with the likes of us for 40% of an entire century. We will never have another pastor that will preach to us as many sermons, who shared with us as many stories, who made us laugh or tear up as often or spend as much time dedicating our little ones or helping bury our loved ones. We will never, I believe, have another lead pastor who sings, well, okay, but whose lifelong spouse sings just like an angel. And we will never have another lead pastor as famous as you 
I'm not just talking about sermons heard and books read literally around the world. No, how on earth did Kellogg, a multinational company out of hundreds of millions of names, pick your name, Dwight Nelson, to put on the back of their cereal box? Come on, never again. But there's also a forever, of course. We will be forever grateful for your memorable ministry. Of course, we'll be forever grateful for you bringing our children and our grandchildren under one roof. And of course, we will forever be grateful for you leaving our sanctuary more beautiful and more comfortable. But what we will be forever most grateful for is the number of us, the number of our family members, and the number of our friends who will have a forever home in heaven just because you were so committed to hear and so faithfully share the quiet voice of God. Dwight and Karen, we love you dearly, and you loved us back. May God richly bless you both and bless the countless souls you have touched forever. You just heard Dr. Hamill address his tribute to both Pastor Dwight and to Karen, and that's so appropriate because we all know that Dwight couldn't have done what we're talking about today without Karen. And here's where Karen would jump in and say, you're right about that. <laughs> so let's enjoy this next feature we've titled By His Side. into a garden he That's the only musician in the world I get to do that to. I could listen to that voice all day. <laughs> it, it occurs to me I do. Uh, For years, Pastor Dwight has been famous for his children's stories. 
We've called this segment One Hand, Two Hands because for years that was his signature closing to the children's story. Raise one hand if you love Jesus and raise the other if you agree with some moral that he was sharing. Best children's storyteller ever. We might have called this segment the Divine Multiplicación. That's Spanish, which Pastor Dwight thinks he can speak. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll translate that for you, the divine multiplication, because just as God blessed the boy with five loaves and two fish, the Lord blessed that boy right there, Pastor Dwight, to be able to multiply through the gift of the spirit and imagination the slimmest set of facts that somebody found in some newspaper somewhere <laughs> into the most wondrous, beautiful, and sometimes hilarious story. And we've loved it for two generations. Hi, my name is Emmett, and I really liked Pastor Dwight because of his jokes, and I also liked how kind and friendly he is. Hi, my name is Arlo. I really like Hake and um, Pastor Dwight's children's stories, and I really like his sermons. My favorite sermon is when he did, when he used the bow and arrow. Pastor Dwight has been my pastor my whole life, and he, he was with us through COVID, and I really enjoy his children's stories and his sermons because he really um, tells us how much God loves us. When I was five years old, I told my mom that I wanted to be baptized by Peter the disciple, but since Peter the disciple was long gone, I told her that I wanted to be baptized by Pastor Dwight, and I hope you still will, Pastor Dwight, even though you're retired. I do children's stories. I love the children's story. I think the children's story is a vital component in a community of faith worship experience, coming in to come up to the throne. I, I want to share with you three reasons why children's stories are important to me. Reason number one, because my college pastor was a master at telling children's stories. I went to Southern College, John Lohr Sr. Uh, was our pastor. He was a powerful preacher, but he just, he took that children's story moment and melded it into the service. And I said, when I grow up someday, I want to tell children's stories like John Lohr. So number one is mentoring and mentoring is important. If you can watch somebody else do it, that's why, you know, this, for what it's worth, this humble little DVD will have a few children's stories on it. You know, just watch. You probably learn more about what not to do, but at least you're watching somebody else do it. So mentoring was important to me. The second reason is I love kids and I want children to, to know that worship is not just about big people, but worship is about a God who loves little people. And because I love children, I want the children to get the big idea. Now, when I teach preaching here at the seminary, I say, hey, guys, ladies, every sermon has to be reduced into one single, simple, solitary, succinct sentence. It's called the big idea, Had Robinson's uh, concept, the big idea. Well, I want the kids to get the big idea. Stories, Jesus loved stories. He, he told them right and left because the stories and, and every culture, it just hangs on a story. And stories are perfect vehicles to communicate the big idea. Number one, I tell children's stories because I was mentored. Number two, I tell children's stories because I love children and I want them to get the big idea. But there's number three. Don't ever forget number three. And that is, I am playing to another audience. And that audience, that is the congregation right out here. I know that everybody in this congregation is sitting there listening to that story because they don't have to hear a sermon now. They're not going to hear Dwight up front kind of pounding in your face or anything else. It's going to be story time. 
And so what I do is uh, when I say play to that audience, I'll throw in a word that I know is incomprehensible to this group right here. But it's done so quick that they pick it up. They know exactly where I'm going without knowing the big idea yet because the punchline always comes at the end of a story. That's what's so powerful of, about a story, by the way. All of television is based on the punchline at the end. If television had the punchline at the beginning, there wouldn't be one advertiser who would pay a penny. You've already told it. They'll never wait till my ad. My ad comes 20 minutes into the program. You have to keep the punchline to the end. But I'm playing to this congregation because I want them to get the big idea wrapped innocuously in a children's tale. Now, these are all my dominant source of stories is the newspaper. You take a three-sentence news report and you can turn it into a five to eight-minute children's story. But the point is, I want the big idea to be clear to the kids I love, but I want that big idea to, in advance of my sermon, already be working its way into the heart and the consciousness of the people I love. That's why I tell children's stories. on the journey of the narrow road and those who've gone before us line the way cheering on the faithful encouraging the weary their lives are stirring testament to God's sustaining grace by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly that we leave, lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. and dreams have come and gone and our children sift through all we've left behind may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find Us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. the 
Okay, so now we are, I'm sorry to tell you, at our very last poll segment. And I'm going to invite you to go through memory lane just a little bit. Here, we just have two questions left. Here's our second to last question. The question is, what year did you first hear Pastor Dwight preach? So take a moment, think it through. Maybe it was on TV. Maybe it was the, the Net series. What year did you first hear him preach? We'll take a moment just to kind of view those years. So I see 1998, ooh, 1983. Some of you were here for that first original sermon. 1986, 2000. So we go quite a ways back among those watching online and amongst all those watching here. How many say amen? amen. Yeah, to this continued legacy of Many generations discovering the preaching of Pastor Dwight. We praise God for that. Okay, last question. And I have to give some direction to the last question. So please don't start submitting yet your answers to it. Let me read it and then kind of describe a little bit of how you need to do it. Okay, because it's a little technical. All right. The question is, if Pastor Dwight has, has impacted your life in a special way, including performing a wedding, baptism, funeral, or some kind of you know, special, significant conversation, please write in your name. But here's the special instruction. Put your first and last name together. If you put a space there, it's going to put it in a weird way, and it'll be a little hard to see exactly whose name is that. Unless you just want to put your first name, and that's okay too if you want to be anonymous. But if you want to put your first and last name in there, don't leave a blank between the first and the last name. Okay. Let's see. Chaplain Jose representing. We see those names, Jonathan Burp, Bruce Fabienko. So again, I mean, lots of ministry has been impacted through funerals, through the years, weddings, conversations after church, conversations in his office, conversations in the cafeteria, conversations as you've been running together, some of you on Friday evening, we heard Ashok's testimony about running together in those conversations. We praise God for that. Ooh, it's getting a little too small to report on now. Sorry about that, but guess what? That's actually some really great news, Pastor Dwight, because it simply means that there's more people here that have been blessed through conversations with you than we can adequately, adequately represent through this technology. So how many say amen to that? Yeah, we praise God for his ministry, the, all those conversations that have had with so many of us through the years. And I want to invite you to turn your attention to the screen for the next video. Happy Sabbath, Dwight and Karen. It really is a temptation to tell a number of stories from our days as neighbors in Maplewood Apartments, but I don't have time for that. Instead, I want to share a way that you really bless my ministry. Uh, the unity of the church has always been a theme uh, that I've heard you preach numerous times. And it was one day that we were speaking on this issue together and you made the statement, you believe that the Seventh Adventist Church should apologize to the African American community. Well, it lent to a growing conviction that I had and a few weeks later, the Lake Union officers uh, stood before the Lake Region camp meeting and indeed did bring an apology for the mistakes, the marginalization, the lack of sensitivity that has taken place within the church. I wish that you could have seen many of the responses as individuals came forward 
and in heartfelt recognition, recognize that this is something that was important and was needed. Thank you for your additional push for us to do that. Through the years, you have courageously preached the Word of God. You've been a man of prayer. You've been a man of conviction. And you have blessed the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not just at Pioneer Memorial Church, but worldwide. I want to thank you, both of you, for your commitment to mission, to ministry, and the difference that you've made. Take care. Bye. On September 27, 2016, my mother passed away that morning. Dwight being my partner in prayer, I sent him a text message and then I closed the, the cell phone. He looked for me all over. He couldn't find me because my cell phone was switched off. But he kept on searching throughout the campus. Finally, he was able to find me in my closed carol in the library as I was trying to work on some assignments, yet weeping. Then, man of God, he prayed for me and the Lord answered his prayer and I was able to withstand the storm, get the means for traveling back home and bury my mother. I will always remember this incident. As he retires, may our God keep on blessing him and using him till he, his family, and all of us meet our Redeemer, our King, and our God when he comes back to take us home, never to part again, never to retire again. In my 10 years on staff at Pioneer, Dwight showed me the true essence of media ministry. He mentored me as I learned to combine technology and ministry. Over many hours of discussion and prayer, we worked through ideas to reach people, transition television, radio, and online viewers into church attenders. I am grateful for the time we spent, the ideas we tried that worked, and I'm even grateful for having experienced things we tried that didn't work. I learned so much more than I have time to share right now. Philo Farnsworth, the inventor of the television, once said, Television is a gift from God, and God will hold those who utilize His divine instrument accountable to Him. Dwight, I am looking forward to the day when we will see the results of the television, radio, and online ministry from your time at Pioneer. I believe that you will hear our Lord say, Well done, Dwight. In the Old Testament, there were three important roles, prophet, priest, and king, all working toward one purpose. That was the Old Testament. In this new dispensation and in this special place, the Lord has seen it fit to organize us differently. Those three great authorities are reconfigured to the extent that is, first and foremost, God's university church for God's university. There are two great authorities among God's people the pastor, and the president. It is a special relationship that few can ever know much about. There have been six presidents since this institution became a university, and today we will hear from two of them. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your attention to the screen for a message from Andrews University President Emeritus, Dr. Niels Eric Andreasen. Dear Dwight, when I first arrived at Andrews, you asked me if I thought you should buy a home in Berrien Springs and settle in for the long term with us. I have wondered all those years why you asked me that question. I also remember what I said in response. Yes, Dwight, you should buy a home in Berrien Springs, put down roots and settle in amongst us. Stay in PMC and keep preaching to us. I cannot think of anyone during my 26 years as university president who took my advice so seriously and so literally as you did, almost to the point of abusing the privilege. Can you believe it? The university pastor listening to the university president. 
Seriously, Dwight, I appreciate your ability to renew yourself over these many years. The summers you spent at home reading books to make the winter sermons more compelling. That was good. It is what a university pastor should do. I also appreciate the thematic series of sermons on religious and social issues we all needed to hear. Once someone asked me why I was not more visible in front in the church. I replied, no, the pastor should be seen and heard in front in the church, not the president. In this church, there are no university presidents, no vice presidents, no deans or chairs, no staff persons or supervisors, no directors, no custodian workers, no campus maintenance staff, even no students. Because on Sabbath, we all sit next to each other in the pews as brothers and sisters, equally fellow believers. No one gives orders in the pews on Sabbath. No one must respond to those. No one has to sit in front and no one in back. The church pew on Sabbath is the great equalizer in our faith community. This is the house of God. The pew is our place. The pulpit is the pastor's. Of course, Dwight, you made the campus rounds to say an invocation or benediction at our events. You dedicated our children, buried the dead and married those in love. The university church also served as the campus chapel, and you served as PMC pastor and senior university chaplain as well. That is the right way. Thank you. And finally, Dwight, thank you for your many, many sermons. I suppose they have changed a bit over the years from the time you were a youthful firebrand till you became the graying parson who has seen it all and weighed it carefully. I recall that I once offered this advice on sermonizing to you. A bit disrespectfully, perhaps, but very nearly right. Dwight, when you preach to us on important topics of church and society, we are all benefited. But Dwight, whenever you preach the gospel, no matter how often, we are all blessed. Thank you for that. And thank you for making PMC your parish home all these years. God bless. This afternoon, I have the honor and privilege of welcoming Andrews University's current president, Dr. Andrea Luxton. Well, Dwight, I would uh, like to join my predecessor in, in thanking you so much for all you have done for Andrews University during these 40 years that you've been here. Uh, you have changed many lives in, in many ways. And later on, I'm going to be giving this to you. But what I say now, I'm going to say around my description of, of, this, of this medallion we're going to give you. We don't give this very often. Uh, it's called the Andrews University President's Medallion. And it was designed by the late Alan Collins. And we know Alan Collins' work because we w w walk past the Jane Andrews sculpture every time we come into this church. Uh, Collins' art, which is really for us three things, this medallion, the Jane Andrews statue, and one other sculpture by him, Regeneration, which is outside our science complex. They all speak to the heritage, meaning, and purpose of Andrews University as a vibrant Seventh-day Adventist university of faith. And so it's especially fitting then today that we are going to present this medallion to you because you have been part of the campus fabric and the global impact of Pioneer Memorial Church and therefore this university for an incredible 40 years. Your remarkable term of service had minister, has ministered to 
and literally inspired generations of Andrews University world-changing students. And you have served alongside four Andrews University presidents. And beginning with my predecessor, you have also joined us as a member of President's Cabinet. And we have valued there your direct ministry and inspiration to our campus administrative group in that very unique and personal way. But as we all know, Pastor Dwight's ministry has inspired not just this campus community every Sabbath morning, but has also reached around the world, from the groundbreaking global evangelism of Net98, as we heard earlier, to the ongoing media ministries of PMC, which continue to reach the world each Sabbath. As I go around alumni meetings, inevitably there's at least one person that comes up to me and say, I still watch Pastor Dwight every Sabbath morning. So those decades of service and the congregational and global impact of your ministry, Pastor Dwight, mean that you are an ideal recipient of this medallion. In this medallion design, the artwork combines three symbols, a bridge, clasping hands, and a garland of achievement. And together, they have a powerful and abiding message. The bridge symbolizes that which spans troubled waters, or brings together that which is separated. And you are a healer. It emphasizes the balance between symbolism and the reality of day-to-day -day living. And you bring balance. Ultimately, it's a design that seeks to symbolically honor selfless involvement, the empowerment of others, healing of relationships, compassion, leadership, and ambassadorship for peace. And those elements are epitomized by the inscription, which says, live today to touch tomorrow. Each of these symbols on this president's medallion speaks to the world's changing impact and profoundly spiritual purpose of your ministry to pioneer Memorial Church, Andrews University, and the world. And it's my honor to present this medallion to you a little bit later in today's program. Thank you. There, of course, could be many stories about the beginning, and this is just one of them. I was surprised that Grady Smoot seemed so intent on telling me how he had worked hard to get Dwight Nelson here to be pastor at Pioneer Memorial Church. I was 24 years old, the youngest staffer in the public relations department, and Dr. Smoot was the president of Andrews University, and so I said, yes, sir. It was, 19, it was September 1983, and Dwight had been preaching all summer long since his first sermon the previous May, and by September it was clear to everyone that he was a hit. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, if this were a worldly audience, which it is not, and if it was anybody else telling the story, they wouldn't say he was a hit. They would say he was... What would they say? He, uh, he was a rock star, and he really was. Except um, because I'm the one telling this story, Dr. Luxton and Elder Mitch, if you can be sure that we're going to stick with hit. <laughs> it, was, um, it was at the end of some employee social event in the cafeteria, and Dr. Smoot mush ushered me into the faculty lounge, which was then on the lower level of the campus center, and we sat in a couple of high back chairs. And he told me that when it was clear that the previous senior pastor, John Cronkey, would be leaving, that Dr. Smoot called up a homiletics professor in the seminary and asked that teacher of preachers who the best and brightest young preachers were that had come out of the seminary in the last few years. And somehow, as a result of that conversation and ensuing dialogue, Dr. Smoot had a name 
but that is all he had. He had a name, and he needed to see the man in action, but this was before the era of sermons on YouTube or all of the other previous technologies that you could go back to all the way to the cassette tape, for those of you that know what it is. And uh, that wasn't good enough for Dr. Smoot, and so the president of Andrews University got on a plane and flew to Oregon and showed up at the East Salem Seventh-day Adventist Church on a Sabbath morning, and he wanted to just slip in and out unnoticed. He didn't want that man on the platform to know he was there, and particularly he didn't want that young man to know why he was there. He wanted to have no interactions with him whatsoever, and when the sermon was over, he tried to slip out a bit and sort of managed and got out pretty much unscathed, except there was one awkward moment of brief eye contact, and Dr. Smoot turned away and quickly got away and made it back to Berrien Springs. But he had his candidate. And of course, he consulted with the president of the Michigan Conference, who made his own trip to Oregon and with the other officers of the conference, and it became very clear to them that they had their man. But it also was very obvious to them that they had a very young man, 30 years old. And as they prepared for what would be a very important meeting with an important group of people in a big Sabbath school room downstairs, they knew that they were going to have quite a challenge persuading a staid and steady and sober church board or board of elders that was used to a certain style of mature leadership for the previous 17 years to suddenly turn this great tradition-oriented university church over to someone who had only been out of the seminary for seven years, who was pastoring some smallish church in Oregon who was 30 years old. And the Lord pulled it off. There were, of course, some diehard skeptics, but they at least could be mollified a bit by the fact that by the time Pastor Dwight would preach his first sermon, he at least would be 31. <laughs> and from Dr. Smoot's perspective, you can understand why he was willing to take that kind of leadership from his own experience. Get this, Dean of the School of Graduate Studies at age 36, Vice President for academic administration at age 37, president of this university at age 44, the youngest president this institution has had since it became a university. Armchair academic pundits and educational historians like to talk about the legacies of university presidents, and Dr. Smoots was huge in so many ways. But you know where I'm going with this. Far and away, the most enduring element of his legacy to Andrews and in the lives of thousands will always be that he, with that group of other leaders, had the faith to allow God to engineer something remarkable that began here on May 14, 1983. Now, that was an important day, and there were a lot of interesting things about that day, and I thought, I thought maybe, maybe we could have a little bit of fun with one of them. Because on May 14, 1983, Dwight Nelson rose, and here we go, for the very first time from this very minister's bench to preach his very first sermon as pastor of this church. He was sitting right here in this very place, right here, right here. Get it? This was it. This was it. Right there. 
On that morning, this bench was over here, right near the end of the piano. There was another one exactly like it over in front of the organ facing the piano. And in 1983, this had been the official minister's bench for this church for 24 years since this sanctuary opened in 1959, and Dwight used it for 15 years himself, this official minister's bench, until 1998 when this platform was entirely remodeled. And this bench, which by then had been the official minister's bench for 39 years, disappeared. And it hasn't been back on this platform for exactly 25 years until three hours ago. Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to do something about this bench. Now, I'm guessing that most of us here are pretty solid Protestants. We don't venerate the relics of the saints. <laughs> as some of our friends do. We don't do that. And no matter how much of a saint he may be, we don't venerate relics. But brothers and sisters, we've got to do something. This is not just a bench. This is a, ooh, bench. <laughs> so what can we do? Well, here's what I thought we could do. I, right now, am calling to order a great big unofficial church business meeting right here, right now, and everybody gets to vote, and it is the biggest unofficial church business meeting this church has ever had, I guarantee you. <laughs> and we're going to do something about this bench. And here's what I propose, ladies and gentlemen. I am hoping, I am hoping that you will go so far with me as to authorize my rather cheesy designation of this truly awesome piece of furniture as the Dwight K. Nelson <laughs> Benchmark of History. I told you it was cheesy. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, think about the history, big and small, in the lives and the minds and the hearts of thousands, the beginning of which all had their mark in this bench. So, as he would say, what do you say? You willing to do that? You ready to take a vote? Okay, now get ready. We're going to do it. Okay, here we go. The Dwight K. Nelson benchmark of history. All right. All those in favor, loud and clear, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, don't you dare. <laughs> the eyes have it. <laughs> I brought that along just in case there was a very slim chance that the vote would go the way I wanted it to. <laughs> On May 14, 1983, I got to sit right there, 23 years old, a camera in my lap, enthralled. And the rest of the time, I was moving quietly around the sanctuary, taking the pictures that you'll see on the screen. And that, brothers and sisters, is just 
one of the stories of the beginning. A church school teacher once asked a class, can a leopard change his spots? The whole class shook their heads, except for one little girl who nods. And so the teacher asked the question again, can a leopard change his spots? Again, they all shook their heads, except for the same little girl who nods. Puzzled, the teacher turns to the young student and asks her to clarify her answer. To which the little girl matter-of-factly replies, I don't know why a leopard who doesn't like his spot can't go to another one. Well, I want you to know that I happen to love my spot in the pastoral ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I wouldn't change spots for all the leopards in the world. We happened to have loved our spot on the West Coast, pastoring the East Salem Congregation in Salem, Oregon. That's why it came as such a surprise to us when we began to see the hand of God pointing us to a brand new spot. And literally for us, overnight, our spots have changed. Does it show? Here you are, a brand new church family for us. And here we are, a brand new church pastor for you. People come to me and they say, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Changing spots? Well, sort of. But maybe excited is a, is the better word to use. I tell you, that word with all its derivatives is certainly a hackneyed word around the Nelson home these days. But I can't think of a better word for us, anyway, to describe this day of new beginnings, a brand new future with the Pioneer Memorial family. Look at you. You're enough to make anybody excited. We come to that moment now when we begin our first encounter in God's Word together. I want you to know that I am going to be coveting these moments in this pulpit with this people week after week after week. I'm going to be looking forward to being here with you Sabbath after Sabbath, and I hope you'll be looking forward to it as much as I am. Before we begin, would you join me in speaking to the author of this book? Father of our family, Lord of these scriptures, speak to us now through this, our first encounter together with you here. Father, hide these two lips and hide these many hearts in the shadow of Jesus' presence. We've come here to hear his voice. In his name, we have come to listen. Amen. Ask, accept, acknowledge. You can't cut the third action off. Three actions to live daily under the cure rather than under the curse. And do you note that all three actions are focused on Jesus? He is the great center. Ask him, accept from him, and acknowledge him. Only by our taking all three actions will the sequel to this story ever be true in the Pioneer Memorial family. There's a sequel, short and simple. You can read it for yourself. And people came to Jesus from every quarter. You want to know what your new pastor's dream is? You want to know what his prayer is for his new family? It's the sequel right here. That people will come to Jesus from every quarter. That every week they can come to this place, to the Pioneer Memorial family, every worshiper every week, and know that here they'll meet that same Jesus who always answers the prayer, I will. I want to. Be clean. But the word will go out from this place and from this pulpit always that the same Jesus still lives. Let the word go out to every quarter. Let the word go out to the dormitory quarters that the people may come. Let it go out to the community quarters that the people may come. Let the word go out to the faculty quarters, to the administration quarters, to the seminary quarters. Let the word go out to the countryside quarters, to the city side quarters. Let the word go out. so that people may come here to Jesus from every quarter. You ask, you accept. Now, go out and acknowledge him. What do you say?
That was the first message. And I'm going to go a little off script because this is what I've learned from Pastor Dwight. You can do that sometimes. Go off script. The fact of the matter is that the gift that Pastor Dwight has and the opportunity that this church and this campus has enjoyed for these 40 years is not because of what he possesses on his own, but because of the blessing that God has given. We really do celebrate God today. He's the one who gives the gifts. He is the best gift giver. Amen? There's 40 more years after that day. And now, through the talent of our church media team, and as Pastor Dwight would say, the best media team on the planet. For the next few moments, sit back, relax, and enjoy a sampling of the word through the years. Now, I can only share with you my personal convictions, but I believe they are convictions that are growing when I say that there is a new wind blowing. I sense a breeze in the balsams. On Tuesday, I had dinner in the cafeteria with a dormitory student. He was sharing with me the story of his life and his convictions about this, his second year on this campus. And he spoke about a new wind blowing. I was visiting last week with one of our student leaders. She was excited. One of the staff of Andrews two weeks ago was telling me he was excited. This last week, October 5, student movement headlines essay handshake was totally wholesome. I think things are different. There is a new and different spirit here and a longing for a more wholesome experience, a deeper spiritual commitment and a stronger sense of purpose for why we are involved in Christian education. I say there's a breeze in the balsams when 1,500 almost Christians in the middle of their busy weeks come together to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. I say there's a breeze in the balsams. Putting Jesus in your skiff doesn't take the storms out of your life. Doesn't mean you're going to have a cloudless sky and a stormless ride to life. Not on your life. Faith does not eliminate the storms. It eliminates the fear of the storms. If you invite Jesus into your life on a daily basis, I know the demons we struggle with, but if you'll invite Jesus in, your soul becomes a fortress and that fortress is impregnable to Satan. And I say, that's good news. What do you say? Our youngest members are our greatest mission, period. I defy anybody to find logic that will gainsay what we just shared. The youngest members of the church are the greatest mission of the church, period, period, period. You know, there are times in your life and in mine when we those tears, those salty tears trickle out the corners of our eyes and we're staring at that blank, dark ceiling in the midnight hour and we feel so God forsaken and all alone and we're sobbing to ourselves and we're asking, is anybody out there at all? My friend, he not only hears those sobs, he not only feels your saltine tears, he is watching you as you cry. You're not ignored by God when you're going through that crisis. Some of you are going through a terrible, terrible chapter in your life right now. And you're saying, there is no way I can make it. My friend, God not only hears your sobs and moans and groans, he sees you. Therefore, if the second coming of the Holy Spirit is what stands between us, between you and me, and the final chapter of Earth's history, I ask you, in the name of God, I ask you, why are we not begging and pleading for that outpouring? 
do you understand that potentially, potentially, you are the generation with the stunning potential of being able to lead this movement to cross over without seeing death. God somehow took down the wall. And if God can take down the wall of my irreconcilable differences with him, then does that not mean that he could come into the wall that I have built up between you and me and he can help me take that wall down between us and no longer are they irreconcilable differences anymore. For the morning star always shines in the darkest hour of the midnight just before daybreak. That's the point. Every time that hideous demon comes to you and he has his sights on your heart, there is a way of escape. You will never be, you will never be cornered. You will never be boxed. You can never be besieged by the enemy, but that God himself will step into that, step into that besiegement and provide a way of escape every time. I'm praying to God for 100 pleaders. God, just 100 pleaders on the campus of Anders University, Barry and Springs, Michigan. 100 pleaders who every day say, please, please baptize me today. Fill me with your spirit. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, it's that simple. It's not hard. You just ask and you receive. You seek and you find. You knock and the door is open to you. But guess what? You and I were bought with a price. Somebody paid at infinite price to have you with him. I wanna tell you something, I have some news for you. Jesus is not coming back until the world gets reached and the church does the reaching because the reaching is part of the strategic plan to change the hearts of the church. That would be you and that would be me. I fight, you face. That's it. Trust me. I know it's a huge Jericho. I've talked to some of you. The Jericho is almost, it's almost crushing. But I'm telling you today on the authority of God's word, you must not quit. You must not turn and run. Go straight forward. That wall is there, but guess who takes down the walls? Stay with him. Somebody's trying to get our attention before it is too late. Not to punish us, come on, get off of that, Jag. Not to punish us, but to rather out of love to desperately awaken us so that we might change course, change course, change course, change course. Pastor Dwight and Karen, I invite you to join us on the platform, along with all the former and current associate pastors. You may sit on the newly named bench. <laughs> <laughs> what God hath wrought. 40 years of preaching. You heard some of it. You have experienced some of it yourself right here. And we're going to be looking in a little while at the song, but you have it here on page 7 in the, in the program. I'll read the verse for you. So, for this shepherd now to you, we raise our voice in praise. For him who reached for all things new and preached your ancient ways. I'll tell you what. Pastor Dwight figured something out early and I didn't know that it was something that was from the very beginning till I just heard it now. He understood Joel 2.28 where it says your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
some of his best inspiration points came after he talked to the college students. He'd brood over that with Jesus, hang out in the text, bring it here. The young people, our college students, the spirit moving in them, moved in his heart, and we were all blessed. It's how you stay current. It's how you stay fresh. A few years ago, I remember you started that advisory of college students, kept leaning in to their voice. Intergenerational ministry is the best. Week after week, year after year, sermon after sermon. How many? We counted them. Didn't we, Pastor Jen? We counted them. We did. You ready to hear the number? It's not 144,000. And it's not 1844. And it's not 1844. The number of sermons, 1,154 messages. Amen. So can we really get our minds around what that means, Pastor Jose? I guess we sort of can. At least we can get what the titles are. Printed on the placards in the pews where you are sitting, one sermon on each placard, front and back, with the date it was preached. Take one or two of those, or however many is necessary, so that every one of them is in the hands of someone in your pew. And now it's the time for us to see. Let them see what God has done through them for 40 years. Listen closely. We have heard a word from the Lord. Amen. We We have heard a word from the Lord. Amen. We have heard a word from the Lord. Amen. Now is the time to put our signs down. And for a moment, put our hands together for the amazing ministry of Pastor Dwight and Karen Nelson. Maybe see these. Uh, I, I tell you what, we're both speechless. It, it's just, I don't know what to say. I've been thinking for eight months now. Well, when you come to that, that last moment, and as, as uh, Rodney pointed out, that'll be May 20 and May 13. But I've been thinking, what, what will you say? And I'm overwhelmed. Both of us are by this production here. This was, this was unbelievable. I had no idea this was happening. And we're not worthy of it, I'll tell you that. This isn't, we didn't earn it. God gave it, and then you love God for doing it, and then you put this together. 
and we're going to love you forever. When we leave this place, as we will, after May 20, and I, I'm going to tell you, I met the new pastor last week for the first time. Spent three hours with Shane. And I assured him, you are taking over a congregation that you are going to fall in love with. And a congregation that will fall in love with you. But I told him, we're, not, we're keeping our membership right here in the Pioneer Memorial Church. We're keeping our membership right here in the Pioneer Memorial Church, but we're going away for a year. We'll find a church in this county somewhere, and we'll worship. But I'm telling you, Shane, one year, and I'm coming back, and I'm sitting on that front row right there. <laughs> oh, no. And he's, you know what? He said, thank you, Dwight. I mean, following somebody that's been 40 years somewhere, it's just... God bless him for taking on that challenge. But you know what? You are, the most, you are the most wonderful people on this planet. And we have fallen in love with you again and again and again. And you're right. It's God in his own mercy has just kept dropping the bottom a little deeper and a little deeper. But I know that when we stand before Jesus one day, as we will, you and I, and Karen. And he will ask, what's the best thing I did for you while you were on this planet? I will look into his eyes and I will say to him, Lord Jesus, that you called us to pioneer for 40 years. I will praise you forever and ever. Amen. And that's our prayer. We love you. We love you with all our hearts. Karen, why don't you say a word? <laughs> Can I sing to them instead? <laughs> you know, we got the call to come here on April Fool's Day. <laughs> and I remember looking up saying, very funny, God. How will we, humble little church pastor and wife, fit into that, and pardon me for saying it, cold, austere, gray brick facility? <laughs> How on earth am I ever going to feel normal and warm again? <laughs> you know what? I don't know what happened. But we felt the most at home here faster than anywhere else we had been. And we loved all of our churches, but we had no idea how you would open up your hearts and your arms to us. And we thank you. We do love you. O oh God, our help in ages past, for 40 years you have given us, through the ministry of this man, a new way to pray, with a new understanding of how to walk and talk with you. A moving and deepening understanding of having you as our forever friend. Joy in the journey of dedicating and raising our next generations in their love and service of you. O oh God, for 40 years you have given us through the ministry of this man, comfort for our sorrows and hope for our grief. A call to the power of Seventh-day Adventist education and our obligation to provide it for our children. A mentor for hundreds, yea, thousands of pastors who you have taught through this, through your example. Oh God, for 40 years you have given us, through the ministry of this man, this great and beautiful house of worship that expands and improves to meet the needs of your people and enriches our experience with you. 
an always vigorous model for keeping the body temple fit to run the race. A sermon by sermon reminder of what it means to read widely, think deeply and be subject to your word. O oh God, for 40 years, you have given us through the ministry of this man, a relentless encouragement to go therefore and share your message to the uttermost parts of the earth. The exalted experience of worshiping you with the richness of the past, the relevance of the moment, and the creativity of the spirit. And through it all, a prophetic, persistent voice to speak the present truth with power to our place and our time. O oh God, our help and God, our hope, we praise you for the gift of the ministry of this man a legacy for years to come. Brothers and sisters, all that remains for us is to first recite and then sing the grandest of all benedictions. It's found in Numbers chapter 6 and it's in your program. Let's recite it together. It's on page 10. The Bible says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turned his face to you. Let's give you peace. Amen. <laughs> 